it's Darius from I-75 CPA Review. Are you on the right road to passing far? Almost every day, I'm on a CPA exam forum, like this one, the Fabulous CPA Exam Club, or this Facebook group, and some questions that I get asked every day on these social media platforms is, hey Darius, what are some of the must-know topics for FAR? Give me a couple of questions. I'm taking FAR this week, and what do I have to know? So I put together a YouTube video, including five must-know, multiple-choice questions for your upcoming FAR exam. And we'll do one question for each topic. So here's topic number one, accounting changes. The question asks, what amount should the company report as depreciation expense for year five? And that's because they're going to change depreciation methods in the middle of the year after having depreciated an asset for several years already. You think they like this question on a CPA for exam? Absolutely. Because they know that you know how to do straight line depreciation. So they're not going to give you just a question on that. Instead, they'll combine it with a question that changes the depreciation method. Or if it doesn't change the depreciation method, it'll change the useful life of the asset, right in the middle of the asset's life. And you'll have to calculate both the old depreciation that was already taken and, based on the new book value, the depreciation for the current year. So let's see what's going on. We got Degner Corp depreciated a $12,000 asset over five years using the straight line method with no salvage value. But at the beginning of the fifth year, it was determined that the asset will last another four years. So they originally divided the 12,000 by five years, got a straight line figure, and they did that for four years. Because at the beginning of the fifth year, it was determined that the asset will last another four years. And they want to know depreciation expense for this year, for year five, the year of change. So what would the exam expect you to know how to do here? Well, you'd start out with the $12,000 original cost back in year one, and you would divide by five years because that was the original life, and that would give you $2,400 per year. And then after four years of depreciation, you'd have $2,400 booked four times into the accumulated depreciation account. So accumulated depreciation would have a $9,600 balance at the end of four years. And that's very important to know because at the end of the fourth year, beginning of the fifth year, they're going to change the life of the asset. With one year remaining, the asset would have a book value or a basis now of only $2,400. How do we get that? That's the $9,600 accumulated depreciation taken away from the $12,000 original cost. So $2,400 is the book value remaining of the asset after four years of depreciation. So if we didn't change the useful life, then in year five, we would just take another $2,400 of depreciation and be done. But it's determined in year five that the asset would last for another four years. So we're going to have to take this $2,400 and divide it by four. And that means $600 will be depreciated each year of that new four-year life. And this is called a change in accounting estimate. So the answer would be $600, which is choice A. Now, changes in estimate, the estimate being the life of the asset, changes in accounting estimate are accounted for in the current year. So that means in year five, the current year income statement is going to show $600 of depreciation expense, and also future years if the estimate change affects both. And in this case, it does, because we're actually going to go into the sixth year and continue to depreciate this asset until all 2,400 of that book value is used up. So in year five, we're going to depreciate 600. In year six, we'll depreciate 600. In year seven, there'll be 600 of depreciation expense and also in year eight. So a change in accounting estimate, it's handled prospectively, which means currently and future years. We don't go back and change anything that happened in years one through four. We consider that information to be good back then, but in year five, that's where we start making the change. 
Now, we always try to anticipate the next question that they might ask based on the same set of facts. That's the finer points of studying for the CPA exam. We're always trying to figure out, based on this set of facts, what could they possibly ask us next time? Well, this time they asked, what amount should Degner Corp report as depreciation expense for year five, the year of change? What if they would have asked, how much is accumulated depreciation at the end of year five? What would accumulated depreciation be after the fifth year? Well, you had 9,600 of accumulated depreciation through the first four years. And now you're just going to add 600 year five depreciation to that. So accumulated depreciation at the end of year five will be 10,200. And that's the way I want you to study for the CPA exam. See the question that they asked, anticipate the next one based on the one that you just saw. Let's go on to topic number two, which is total comprehensive income. And the question asks, which of the following is an element of total comprehensive income? All right, what in the world is total comprehensive income anyway? Comprehensive income is the change in owner's equity, stockholder's equity, caused by everything other than investments by owners and distributions to stockholders. So dividends paid to stockholders would not be a reduction of total comprehensive income. And owners contributing to capital would not be an addition to total comprehensive income. So with that in mind, let's do this question. Which of the following is an element of total comprehensive income? So all changes in equity other than resulting from increases by owners and distributions to owners. Well, A says investments by owners. So that would not touch comprehensive income. It'll touch equity, but it won't touch comprehensive income. What's comprehensive income? All changes in equity caused by other than investments by owners and distributions to stockholders. So A and C are out. B says sales revenue and sales revenue increases the income statement. And what's good for the income statement is good for equity. Why? Because the income statement, the net income gets closed to retained earnings and retained earnings is part of equity. So sales revenue is a good choice because that would positively impact total comprehensive income. What about deferred revenue, letter D? What is deferred revenue anyway? Deferred revenue is where you collect cash in advance, but you haven't earned it yet. So the journal entry is debit cash credit deferred revenue or unearned revenue. Deferred revenue is a liability. It's a liability account deferred revenue. So it's not equity at all, it's debt. Because you got the cash up front, but you gotta earn it. If you don't earn it, they're gonna ask for it back. So deferred revenue is a liability, which makes it not equity. It doesn't impact equity, so D is out. So which of the following is an element of total comprehensive income? Sales revenue would be an increase in total comprehensive income. Expenses would be a decrease in total comprehensive income. Remember, we're always trying to anticipate the next question that they could ask based on these set of facts. So if next time around you have expenses as a choice, that would be an element of total comprehensive income. It'll reduce it. All right, topic number three comes to us courtesy of computer software. What do you do with computer software costs on the CPA FAR exam? Well, you might recall that you expense the early costs as R&D, research and development. So prior to having a product that's technologically feasible, all the costs that go into your new software product is expensed. Expensed as R&D. And you expense it because most R&D expense goes nowhere, which means it never becomes anything usable. But if you do have technological feasibility, if you reach that stage with computer software, you then begin to capitalize costs. And if you capitalize them, it means you're going to amortize them and charge them to expense over the periods benefited. So this question has to do with the computer software costs that you capitalize and now have to charge to expense. How do we charge those previously capitalized computer software costs to expense? That's what this question requires you to know. So at the beginning of year five, Mirage Corp has 2 million in capitalized software costs. 
and they expect to be able to sell $10 million worth of the software product over five years. Is that important? How much they expect to sell of this software product? Yes, it is. The expected sales of the product are important because then we could just match the expense against the revenue in the same period. Unless there's another rule specific to software that tells us how to charge software costs off to expense. So we have $10 million worth of expected sales over five years. And there's $2 million of capitalized software costs that we're waiting to expense. Can we take that 2 million and divide by the five years and take 400,000 a year as a straight line method? Is that allowed? The answer is yes, that is a calculation that we've got to be able to do. Recognize that there's $2 million of capitalized software costs and we expect to sell product over five years and that's a $400,000 straight line expense. But we don't automatically take that straight line expense of 400,000 because computer software has specific rules. And one of the rules is to do that calculation that we just did, divide the $2 million of capitalized software costs by the five years that we expect to sell the product and get 400,000. And just take that 400,000 and put it aside for a second because we need to do a different calculation and compare the results. So right here, we did the straight line method. We took the $2 million of capitalized software costs, divide by the five years that the product's expected to be sold, and we did come up with 400,000. That's the straight line amount. So hold that aside, but we got to compare that to what's called the percent of revenue method. Remember, they gave us the revenue expected from the sales of all this software, and that's $10 million. Then the question goes on to tell us that sales in this year, the first year, are $3 million. So think about it. If we're going to sell $3 million of the $10 million in this first year, and a lot of software is more useful in its first year, becomes obsolete, I guess, after time. So $3 million over $10 million, that's 30% of the sales are expected from the software in this current year. So 30% of the software is expected this year. Let's take 30% of the total capitalized costs of 2 million and we'll calculate that to be 600,000 and we'll compare the 600,000 to the 400,000 straight line and take the greater of the two and expense it this year. So how much are we gonna expense this year for software costs that have previously been capitalized? The answer will be 600,000 letter C. So which method do we use? The straight line method or the percent of revenue method? Well, you take the greater of the two. One more look at the percent of revenue method. They told us that we're expected to sell 10 million worth of product over five years. So that's the denominator, 10 million. 10 million of sales are expected over five years. What about this year's sales of the software? Sales this year were 3 million of the 10 million. So if 3 million of the 10 million occurred this year, that's 30%. Let's take 30% and we'll multiply that times the $2 million of capitalized software costs and we'll charge off 600,000 of software costs this year and match it against this year's sales. So with computer software costs, remember to take the greater of the two methods, straight line versus percent of revenue. And you can see why I picked this question to be a must know, because with two calculations required just to get the question right, you know the CPA exam is going to love that. All right, here's question number four, goodwill impairment. Now, why did I choose goodwill impairment? Because it recently changed. Back in January of 2020, they said, you now have to know the new rules for goodwill impairment. Well, in the beginning, they probably pre-tested it, but by now, September of 2020, you could certainly expect them to ask you a question on the new rules for goodwill impairment. So let's try this. In year one, Plant Corp acquired Seed Corp in a business combination. Seed has two reporting units. So the subsidiary that was acquired has two reporting units. The carrying value and fair values for each of the two reporting units 
of Seed Corp at year end, here they are. So the reporting unit of Seed Corp, they have two of them. One's the Mullen unit, the other one is the Barrett unit. What is the amount of goodwill impairment at year end? And the way you test for goodwill impairment now is you simply compare the carrying value with the fair value at each unit. So for the Mullen unit, the carrying value is a million three. The fair value is actually higher than that, which is good news. That means the Mullen unit is not at all impaired because the fair value of that unit is greater than its carrying value. It should only be like that. You pick zero for the answer. But there's another unit, Barrett unit. Here the carrying value is a million seven. What's the fair value? Ah, it's a million six. So the fair value is dropped below the carrying amount. And for goodwill impairment, it's that simple. You just compare the fair value to the carrying value, and you see how the Barrett unit has 100,000 of goodwill impairment, but the Mullen unit has no goodwill impairment. Doesn't matter. If you have one that's impaired, you have to recognize it. And so the answer would be C. They have $100,000 of goodwill impairment. Just because the Mullen unit happens to be $50,000 higher in value than the carrying amount, that doesn't knock out the Barrett unit's goodwill impairment. So the journal entry would be loss on goodwill impairment, 100,000, and a credit to goodwill. And the thing to remember is that goodwill is tested at the level of the individual reporting unit. So we didn't take the two units together because if we did that, then we might think the answer would be 50,000 because the Mullen unit is actually $50,000 higher than carrying amount, but that did not impact our impairment calculation of the Barrett unit because goodwill is tested at the individual reporting unit level. Now we're always trying to anticipate the next question, right? So next time they might have the Mullen unit even higher with a fair value. Maybe the fair value is 2 million of the Mullen unit next time, which means $700,000 overvalued compared to the carrying value and the battery unit would still be this way where they have a hundred thousand dollars of goodwill impairment and you'd still have a hundred thousand dollars of goodwill impairment because the Barrett unit would be tested on its own and so would the Mullen unit so one unit would have nothing to do with the other let's go on to number five earnings per share they want to know what's the number of shares that Kane Corp should use to calculate year two basic earnings per share. So we just want the denominator in the earnings per share calculation. It's net income divided by number of shares outstanding on a weighted average basis. So we want that weighted average calculation for the denominator. So Kane Corp had 120,000 shares of common stock outstanding at January 1st, year two. So they started the year off with 120,000 shares, but we're not gonna use the beginning of the year figure for earnings per share. We're not gonna use the end of the year figure for earnings per share either. We're gonna use some weighted average number of shares. So on July 1st, which is halfway through the year, the company issued 40,000 additional shares of common stock for cash of $2 million. So those 40,000 shares come online in the middle of the year. If we're gonna do a weighted average calculation, that's really the equivalent of only 20,000 shares for a full year. Also outstanding all year, 10,000 shares of convertible preferred stock. When were they converted to common? October 1st of year two. So for three months, we had 10,000 more shares. So we have to do a weighted average of those 10,000 shares and multiply times three over 12 to see how many shares that equals on a weighted average basis. What is the number of shares that Kane Corp should use to calculate year two basic earnings per share? And we start out with 120,000 original shares from the beginning of the year. They were outstanding for all 12 months. So that equals 120,000 on a weighted average basis. We simply multiply by 12 over 12. But the 40,000 that were issued July 1st, they're only outstanding for six months out of 12. And that's the same as 20,000 shares on a weighted average basis. Then the last 10,000 shares, they were only outstanding from October 1st to December 31st, that's three months. So 10,000 times three over 12, that equals 2,500 more shares. And if you add all three of these up, you have a total weighted average number of shares outstanding of 142,500, which happens to be letter C. 
But there is another way to calculate weighted average common shares outstanding. Yeah.